so hello everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Lina and uh, Vilus for organizing this event. It's awesome to be speaking live. Um, I'll talk about, uh, as Willis said, about the uh, post-COVID effects on banks. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Aris Klimoshauskas. I say that I am a deal specialist. I work at KPMG and I work with my network to help clients uh, close deals. Um, for the benefit of Lithuanian clients, we utilize our network. And it just so happened that through the years, it uh, I got a bit of a specialization in the financial services sector. As you can see, I've put in some of the deals that we concluded. Uh, it just so happened that quite a lot of them were in this space and we did a lot of portfolio deals and now we're helping a lot of newcomers in Lithuania as well. So I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk about my experiences there and what I see both, both working with the big banks and with the newcomers. So when we think about post-COVID and the effects, I tried to structure the presentation in such a way to cover many things. So I came up with a few things that I won't cover, because I think they will either have been covered or just take too long. Obviously, when we talk about the effect on the banking sector, we need to talk about the government policies, but I'll try to stay away from that. Maybe we'll have that for, for the panel. So I thought to structure it in a bit of a different way. I'll set the scene. I'll talk about what the effects are for the big banks, the incumbents. Uh, then sort of discuss about fintechs and newcomers. And as a conclusion, I'll take part three. So looking through the eyes of the client, what can the clients expect uh, then to be sort of the outcome of what I'll discuss in the first two parts. So that's uh, more or less my structure. Does it sound interesting? We'll, we'll see, we'll see, right? We'll see, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so let's start with one. So what are the effects now? So now just to set the scene, I'll show you a few slides about uh, things that you probably already know. Okay, so the first thing that we have to remember, what happened post-COVID, right? What happened post-COVID was that the Central Bank of Lithuania, uh, they eased the counter-cyclical capital buffer. Basically, they came out and said, look, uh, we had these uh, imposed. Now it's a situation where we can let the banks lend a bit more. And one way to do this is through the policy. And according to the bank's old calculations, this should have amounted to about 1 billion euros in Lithuania of corporate lending. That was, that was sort of their idea. They said, okay, uh, banks should be able to lend about 1 billion euros. So this happened in uh, March. Now in April, April came. And we had another very, very interesting thing that happened. We had a moratorium. So all the banks got together and said, we are OK with uh, changing the schedules for those clients who will find it difficult to make loan payments due to COVID. OK, so that was, that was a nice idea. And again, the idea of, of the banks here, together with the central bank, was to make sure that we don't run into a liquidity crisis the same way we did as in 2008, where we had both a capital crisis and a liquidity crisis. So they said, for the liquidity part, we will restructure. Uh, we will allow clients perhaps to pay just the interest part for a few months. So they said, for the next six months, up until October, uh, this is what we're going to do. Now, this has a very, very interesting effect when you think about the client, obviously, because the client pays much less money, also has a very interesting effect on the banks themselves. Because typically, according to accounting rules, if a client is late this in a payment or a payment is rescheduled, potentially this loan becomes no longer a performing loan and possibly the bank has to increase provisions for that. But for the time being, we're in a situation where this is not the case and banks may not have to think about it directly today. Okay, so what else has happened? We talked about this a lot, so I won't talk about it a lot, but there's been huge influx of capital. Uh, we have a, we're gonna have a fund now, which is gonna lend about a billion of liquidity. Uh, these are last in Vegas statistics that were, came out just three days ago, so 300 million euros of in mega uh, money have already reached the market. All in all, the figure is five billion. So this is what we hear in the news, five billion for our economy, 5 billion euros is going to be coming to companies. So we have to take that into account as well. What's going to be the effect or what has already been the effect of this? One thing that you may conclude from my first three slides is that we should have seen an increase in banking. 
But if we look at the statistics of ECB, Lithuania is one of those countries which has um, basically had a 9% decrease in the corporate lending cor portfolio in the last 12 months, looking at statistics of June 2020. Now, why has this happened? I mean, there are several reasons, obviously. I totally understand why the banks don't want to lend more. They look at it from a risk perspective, and they know that this is not equity coming into the companies. This is debt. This is debt which has uh, effect on the covenants, debt which will need to be repaid by those clients. Uh, what else could be happening here? Um, perhaps um, newcomers are coming to the market. So if we look at the, just the big corporate lenders, maybe their portfolios are being taken over by the credit unions, the fintechs, that could be happening. So quite a few things are happening. Uh, my first question to you today was, if we remember the slide that we had, so we have uh, 300 million euros of Invega money coming. Uh, Invega puts the money in the market in two ways, basically, two directions, by themselves and then through banks. Now, if I had to ask you to guess what kind of percentage does Invega do through banks, through other uh, market players in the market, what would your guess be? What percentage of this 300 million? Close to 100. Well, okay, so Invega is not as bad as, uh, as one would think. They do still have a lot of channels, but yes. Uh, do you agree with, with close to 100? Does anybody have a, another view? 1%, 1% which would mean that everything goes through Invega? Okay, so two pretty marginal answers, good. Uh, the actual figure is 82%. So 82% of, of this 300 million was disseminated to the Lithuanian market uh, via banks that are working in the market. Now, this is one of the things that I think is a big positive because now definitely this is an outlet for the newcomers. So for the, for the big banks, these tickets may be a bit too small, but for example, SME Finance says that already 12.3 uh, million euros have come through them, and for them 12.3 million is actually quite a reasonable part of their portfolio. So I think one of the reasons and one of the positives in the markets for the newcomers is that they're utilizing uh, their situation for the benefit of increasing their portfolio and footprint on the market. So that's one thing that, that's happening. What else is happening? So how about the non-performing loans, the NPLs? So this is a bit of a tricky situation because I have a feeling that now banks are having a bit of a tough time identifying which loans are really non-performing loans, which loans would have been non-performing loans were it not for the moratorium or the increased uh, influx of money into their uh, borrowers. So these, I would call them 2 BNPLs, the performing loans that would have turned into non-performing loans are really not really dis distinguishable from what I would call COVID, uh, COVID PLs. So these loans are a bit disguised. They may have uh, become bad loans, but now all of a sudden there's so much money and the rules are a bit lighter, so now they're no longer real uh, non-performing loans. What could be an effect of that? Well, I think for the banks, obviously it's an issue about portfolio quality. And if we look back at the crisis of 2007, 2008, it was a credit crisis. Nobody could really understand how it happened that the portfolios of the banks were so bad that nobody had noticed. And so for 10 years since then, we had really, really, really strict rules. But now this could be one of the effects that we need to keep our eye on for the bank portfolio quality. What's another outcome? So some of these MPLs, as we discussed, have now received funds and grants, so they are in better shape. So the banks would have had a real sort of trouble getting these things off their books, but now these companies get the funds, so now they're in better shape. And I think this is another interesting thing that will happen in the next few years is we're gonna have a portfolio market. So banks will start offloading these, uh, whether in portfolios, whether it's non-priority assets or to change the structure for any reasons. And there are lots of buyers in the market because now these loans look much better than they used to. So the bank wants to get, get rid of them and even get a bit of money off of them. And there are lots of buyers in the market, uh, many companies such as Intrum and other market participants who are very happy to take these assets on because they have a bit of a higher risk tolerance 
or are risk management companies. So my prediction is next few years we'll probably see a bit more banking portfolio deals. Third thing, well, yes, clients love themselves some grants and some aid. But if you take over too much of it, I think a big issue is going to be when you come for refinancing. Because if you have uh, relationships with the banks, basically you have covenants which you cannot breach, whereas the rules for getting state aid are much more vague. But you will pile on that debt as a client. And what happens when you need to refinance, you may find it very difficult to talk with the banks. I think my main slide which I wanted to show is the sort of kicking the can down the road slide. So the moratorium should end, or let's say it was uh, designed in such a way that it's, it's a temporary measure and October comes, uh, the central bank and the commercial banks will need to make some tough decisions. Do we prolong the moratorium or do we not? Either way, there will come a day when the moratorium, I think, will end. And I'll talk about this more in, in the final slide, but this is something to keep in mind that the, the good times that we have now may suddenly come to an end based on uh, various parameters and not necessarily in the best time for the clients. So let's keep that in mind and let's see how the fintechs are doing. So the fintechs. Well, I think fintechs overall have a bit of a, of a different, uh, different situation in the market. Obviously, the thing that we talk a lot with our clients now is cost of risk is low. Again, here we have another article from SME Finance and they say that the quality of our portfolio is even better than pre-crisis levels. It's only 8%. Are we, are we surprised by that? Well, when you think about how much money has been poured into, into clients, I think it's hardly surprising. However, if we look at our history a bit, so this is a graph from, from the Bank of Lithuania showing percentage of non-performing assets as part of the portfolio. Okay, yeah, we're, you know, people typically use this graph to show in what good shape we are as an economy, and I have to agree with that. But I also remember not the not so uh, distant future where the percentages were very different, and this is where we may be heading. Of course, of course, you can, you can say that in 11 and 12 we still had heritage from the vintage 06, 07, 08 portfolios. I agree with you on that. But if we pile on enough debt on companies, we may be coming back to a bit of a different situation. So for fintechs, this is a huge risk in my view. Because they have designed their models and their business plan mostly according to the good part of the economy the last three, four, five years where cost of risk was very, very low, very, very low. So for them, this might be uh, something to think about going forward. Regulatory. I'm glad I don't have to speak a lot about regulatory because Ekaterina and Federica covered it a lot. But again, uh, for banks who have people, who have structures, it's easier to swallow this pill of regulatory costs rising rather than fintech. So what's going to happen to the fintechs? I know Justinus is going to talk after me. Hopefully, he'll share some ideas. My take is, as an m and specialist, that probably we'll see a lot of fintech deals. Fintechs will want to be bigger, so they'll start merging. They want to have a bit more of a, of a cost base. Uh, two things are happening as well that I think will facilitate that process. One, fintech funding is falling. If you look at the statistics, typically it will be that the figures themselves are high, but they're going to a much smaller number of fintechs. So private equity funds, VC funds, they love themselves a bit of the big ones, but the smaller fintechs, they're finding it a bit of a different uh, situation now. So this will lead to deals as well, mergers. And I always an interesting is to track deposits. Deposits are flowing into banks. We see that in Lithuania. We see that in the US. There's, we see that in the UK. So the more, uh, let's say, in uncertain times, I would argue that fintechs will find it hard to get clients and get money. These will tend to flow to the more established players which have more of the market trust. So to conclude, to conclude, let's look at this from the eyes of the clients and see what's going on. So how will this affect the clients? So 
my Inglorious Bastard slide was the one I came up with because I thought there's three, three things that are going to happen and the situation may change very, very quickly just as it did in that movie. So what's going to happen to clients if we think about the moratorium and the potential of that situation being lifted? Well, the first issue for them is going to be that it may come at a time where they have not balanced, let's say, their uh, cash flows and it is not a, they don't know which time it's going to be. So if you tell anybody you're going to have to repay a loan or, or in three months, four months, it's going to be a very tough situation. So there's a lot of uncertainty for clients. Two, the clients will be used to paying just the interest part on loans. They will not have made the tough decisions that perhaps they sh would have made in a different situation. Yes, that would have had a positive effect on the business, I agree. But if, uh, if banks give them a call and say, from tomorrow you're going to have to pay not just the entrance which you're used to, but your actual payment will now be with the principal, again, the clients may not be able to service these loans. And three, the, loan, uh, the payment themselves will potentially be bigger. Because if you have enough of sort of vacation time and just pay the interest, now the resulting payment will actually be even bigger than you had pre-crisis level. So this leads me to believe that banks should have these discussions with their clients today. So not to have very many unhappy clients somewhere down the road. Finally, I already talked about less uh, trust. There was a very interesting um, survey done uh, here in Lithuania about how many clients change their banks in the last five years. I think it was conducted by general financing. I couldn't find it. So your estimate in Lithuania, if the question is how many, they ask clients, have you changed your bank provider in the last five years? Yes, no. How many people said yes? 20% will that's a good guess, solid guess. Just 20%, anybody willing to go higher? Yeah. 10. Said, accountant, conservative, risk averse. That's exactly correct, it's, it was 14%. So even though fintechs get a lot of coverage, really they can only tap into a certain, let's say a certain part of the market. Innovators, early adopters, so with 14%, this is more or less where fintechs still are. Again, you still may, may give a bit of a different picture. It will be very interesting to hear. My feeling is, again, in times of assert, uncertainty, these clients also tend to drift towards incumbent banks, the big banks, the safe banks in their view. Uh, a similar survey in the UK said it was just 9%. So this is my second conclusion today. In times of, of uncertainty, fintechs may have a hard time getting clients. And third and last conclusion, again, tougher regulation means, in general, less clients and less risky clients. And it will come as no surprise to you to know that, in general, lots of the profitability generated by fintechs and uh, payment institutions come from the risky part of the curve, from the clients that banks, as Yekaterina said, say no to or, or don't onboard for different reasons that will be squeezed a bit as well, and clients themselves may have less and less options to do banking, unfortunately. That's it, those are my three conclusions. I'd like to leave you with kicking the can down the road graph, which I think is a very, very important thing to remember as we go further through this post-COVID era. Thank you.